Good morning, everyone. I hope you all are doing well. Uh, today's topic of discussion would be extrahepatic biliary apparatus or biliary apparatus. The competencies here includes to enumerate the various parts of extrahepatic biliary apparatus and describe in detail about the parts, relations, blood supply, nerve supply, lymphatic drainage, and applied anatomy of the gallbladder. And formation, course, termination, relations and blood supply of the bile duct or biliary tree as such. What is extrahepatic biliary apparatus? Before that, we should understand that biliary or uh, excretory apparatus of liver, we call it actually the passages through which the hepatic bile and the gallbladder bile are conveyed into the second part of duodenum. Okay, so uh, this apparatus is actually divided into two parts, intrahepatic and extrahepatic. Intrahepatic is usually covered with the uh, histology or uh, anatomy of liver only, which includes bile canaliculi, bile ductules, and right and left hepatic ducts. Finally, these right and hepatic ducts will join together and they form part of extrahepatic biliary apparatus. So its function already I told you to receive the blood from the liver and then to store and concentrate it in the gallbladder and to transmit it into the second part of the duodenum whenever required. It is actually important to understand uh, this system, this, this apparatus actually because the various disease processes such as uh, cholelithiasis that means stones of the gall, uh, gallbladder or stones of the biliary tree or inflammation related to the biliary tract or a gallbladder cholecystitis and also to understand the surgical processes related to the gallbladder or the system called as cholecystectomy. That's why the anatomy of this biliary apparatus is very important so that if any surgical processes are procedures are, are to be done we should know first the normal anatomy because n number of variations are related to this apparatus. So biliary apparatus components it includes uh, gallbladder, this, this is the gallbladder, then we have cystic duct, this one, right and left hepatic ducts, the two ducts they join together to form common hepatic duct. Now this common hepatic duct is joined by cystic duct from its right and they are forming the common bile duct. So these are all the components of biliary apparatus or extra hepatic biliary apparatus. So first coming to gallbladder, it's a pear shaped organ, we can see here like a pear, okay, it's a pear shaped organ, reservoir of the bile, capacity is approximately 30 to 50 uh, ml, situated in, a, in the gallbladder fossa of the liver, okay, we can see here. See here, uh, we have uh, this liver, right and left lobe, you all know, this is the uh, inferior or visceral surface and this is posterior surface now in the visceral surface near the inferior sharp border here in the visceral surface we have this depression this is called as gallbladder fossa where we have location of the gallbladder and it is connected to porta hepatis by this cystic duct so this porta hepatis is a point of initiation of extra hepatic biliary apparatus Okay, so this is the fossa for gallbladder in the right lobe of liver. And uh, as such, it will be attached to the liver by right and left hepatic ducts, which uh, th through its cystic duct actually, it is joining the common hepatic duct. Okay, and it extends from right end of the porta hepatis to inferior border of the liver. This is the extent of gallbladder fossa actually. In the cadaveric specimen, you can see here, this is your gallbladder fossa. This is a, the depression is a fossa on which we have this gallbladder with its duct, cystic duct. This is the area of porta hepatis. Okay, this is inferior surface. Functions of the gallbladder. It stores and concentrates a bile 10 times more than that of liver bile. It reduces the alkalinity of hepatic bile and it equalizes the ductal biliary pressure. Uh, it has uh, seen that when a meal, predominantly fatty meal, appears in the duodenum, the gallbladder contracts and it uh, actually the contraction is produced by or stimulated by a hormone called as cholecystokinin 
secreted by the uh, duodenal mucosa and this acts upon the gall bladder and leads to contraction and the sphincter of body relaxes and bile flows into the small gut this is by this hormone cholecystokinin okay so and what is bile actually it is an emulsifying agent which facilitates pancreatic lipase for hydrolysis of lipid it, uh, so pancreatic lipase it requires bile for hydrolysis of lipid components of a food as such the, the, you, this is liver diagrammatic representation showing the inferior surface of liver where we have gallbladder fossa this gallbladder fossa is one of the non peritoneal structure of the liver okay like the bare area of liver which is not covered by peritoneum similarly gallbladder fossa is non peritoneal area where we have this gallbladder with its duct cystic duct lying over here usually there will be some small amount of fatty tissue in between the two or sometimes there can be connection fibers bands also connecting the two so and the part which is hanging outwards this is called as fundus and the part which is below the inferior surface this part is covered by peritoneum whereas the part which is in contact with liver it is not covered by peritoneum so it is covered by peritoneum except for the surface resting on the liver this is the peritoneal relations of gall bladder now as such what are the parts very simple you can make out here the fundus this is the blind end actually the blind end on one side which is hanging from the inferior border of the liver this is called as fundus of the gall bladder from the fundus up to the neck the main part the main body of the gall bladder we call it then because it has body the connection with the duct it is called as neck of the gall bladder very small part and sometimes an infundibulum also a projection a pouch like structure from the neck of the gall bladder you will find called as infundibulum or hartman's pouch of the gall bladder and another important thing is duct here cystic duct okay which connects with the common hepatic duct approximately it is 10 cm in length and 3 cm in width at its Uh, widest part now coming to each part one by one okay so first is fundus i as i told you the expanded blind free end of the gall bladder which projects from the inferior border of the liver we can see it this is inferior border this only this part you can see actually it is directed downwards forwards and towards right okay uh, completely surrounded by peritoneum now uh, this actually clinically is very important you must have heard about transpyloric plane an imaginary plane passing through the first lumbar vertebrae or junction of the l1 l2 it is actually the meeting point of this right lateral plane mid clavicular line and transpyloric plane here at the tip of the ninth costal cartilage which actually represents the point of fundus of gall bladder or we can also say this is a point where your uh, right linea semilunaris will cut across or will meet the costal margin right costal margin or simply the the transverse uh, the transaction of mid clavicular line right mid clavicular line and transpyloric plane this point here is actually the point of tip of the ninth costal cartilage where you have presence of fundus of gall bladder exactly coming to the body from the fundus to the neck is a body direction will be same it is directed uh, backwards upwards and towards the left actually it is fundus is like downwards from the fundus we have body it is going upwards backwards and towards left this will be left okay and this body of gall bladder neck from the body we have small part very small part but it is tortuous somewhat tortuous s shaped from body to the cystic duct first upwards forwards and then backwards and downwards so s shape it curve is there now from this neck of gall bladder we have a small diverticulum as i said infundibulum or hartman's pouch it is called as it is like a blind sac projected uh, downwards and backwards towards the duodenum okay also called as isthmus this is actually uh, the area which sometimes we may not think but usually if it is present 
it may lead to lodgement of stone so this is one of the site very small site and very common uh, site for lodgement of stones so relations of the gallbladder for relations we can uh, consider gallbladder as a single organ where we are not uh, classifying like pandas body and neck so as such the anterior relations will be the liver we can see the inferior surface gallbladder fossa so here the uh, the gallbladder is separated from the liver by loose areolar tissue and which also contains deep branch of cystic artery okay i'll show you in the next picture and in front of these there will be uh, anterior abdominal wall as you go behind behind will be another structures we'll discuss here see this is a transverse colon so behind or below you can say we have this transverse colon and first part of duodenum so first part of duodenum and actually these are this is fundus so fundus is completely related to anterior abdominal wall in front but if we say about body body and part of fundus we have liver and anterior abdominal wall anteriorly and behind we will be having duodenum first part and transverse colon below or behind you can say okay and on the right side there will be right colic flexure this is called as colic flexure so hepatic flexure right colic flexure towards the left side there will be pyloric part of the stomach this is actually the relation of the main part the body okay of the gallbladder and here we have this artery cystic artery which is coming from the hepatic artery right hepatic artery mostly this cystic artery enters into the fossa and this usually lies it divides into two branches anterior and posterior so the posterior branch and the main trunk actually lies in the fossa in between the gallbladder and the liver okay this is cystic artery now coming to blood supply blood supply of gallbladder uh, cystic artery which is a branch usually from right hepatic artery cystic artery divides into superficial and deep as i told you earlier it divides into two branches one will be anterior posterior or superficial and deep to the gallbladder deep will run in the fossa superficial will run here on along the inferior surface or anterior posterior you can say and venous drainage will be similar vein cystic vein which usually drains into the intrahepatic part of the portal vein so cystic artery we can see clearly here this artery is coming usually from right hepatic artery but there can be n number of variations okay this is your uh, celiac trunk giving rise to this common hepatic artery from common hepatic artery we have a hepatic artery proper which divides into right and left hepatic artery right hepatic artery gives cystic artery now as i said number of variations can be there most common is like it takes origin from right hepatic but it can be from left hepatic artery also cystic artery can be branch from gastro duodenal artery also which is a branch from common hepatic or it can arise from uh, location you can say lower part and in running in front of this common uh, hepatic duct or it may arise, it may form a loop it may run below the cystic duct or it may we having two branches i mean two different cystic arteries it can be one dividing into anterior and posterior usually but it can be two directly arising from right hepatic artery so these why these are important we should know that cystic artery from where it is arising okay so normally uh, if we know the normal course and if we make out the number of variations at the time of surgery surgeons have to keep in mind all these variations okay so that at the time of ligation they should take care of these points also another important thing here is an imaginary triangle called as calot triangle which is bounded by under surface of the liver superiorly okay to the left side by common hepatic duct and to the right side by cystic duct so cystic duct common hepatic duct and liver inferior surface of liver they form a triangle called as calot triangle the contents of this triangle the most important content is here the blood vessels cystic artery and vein which forms the pedicles of and cystic duct here cystic artery and vein and cystic lymph node actually one lymph node is present here not uh, in this triangle okay so cystic artery vein and cystic lymph node are the components or the content of this triangle this triangle is also called as cystohepatic 
triangle this is very important here because in the surgeries related to gall bladder ligation of cystic artery is to be done in this triangle is one, which is one of the crucial steps in surgical removal of gall bladder or cholecystectomy okay so we have to remember the this triangle here we have to reach up to this triangle if you know the boundaries you can easily reach up to this triangle okay uh, here i would like to mention about the pedicle of the gall bladder so the pedicle actually consists of a cystic duct from before backwards if you can see cystic duct then there will be cystic artery and along with cystic artery there will be vein so cystic duct cystic artery and cystic vein they form the pedicle of the gall bladder now lymphatic drainage of the gall bladder most of uh, the lymph vessels from the gall bladder they drain into cystic lymph node located in the calot to the hepatic lymph nodes and celiac group of lymph nodes and it has been found that in cholecystitis mostly the cystic lymph node which is present in calot triangle mostly it gets enlarged nerve supply nerve supply can be uh, sympathetic and parasympathetic sympathetic uh, here it forms actually the plexus called as celiac plexus along the celiac trunk and hepatic plexus in the, around the porta hepatis and the fibers for sympathetic nerves they are coming from t7 to t9 segments of the uh, thoracic uh, uh, t7 to t9 thoracic segments and uh, they are actually because it is sympathetic so it is vasomotor and motor to sphincters parasympathetic comes from right and left vagus nerves they are motor to musculature of gall bladder and bile ducts and they are inhibitory to sphincters uh, some few twigs of right phrenic nerve also supply the postganglionic parasympathetic fibers to the gall bladder this is important here because if you know this nerve supply you will make out what are the different uh, areas where the pain of the gall bladder gets referred so what is referred pain actually when disease is somewhere else but pain is somewhere else so patient is coming to you with pain in one area but actually the disease is somewhere else that is called as referred pain and this referred pain is usually due to same dermatome or same innervation by the uh, same nerve supply to the two different areas or same dermatomal arrangement so for uh, cholecystitis or pain of the gall bladder referred pain sites are one is the inferior angle of uh, scapula which uh, is because of the sympathetic fibers it will be at the back okay and uh, tip of the right shoulder it is because of right phrenic nerve phrenic nerve is c3 c4 and this uh, part tip of the right shoulder is also supplied by c3 c4 fibers supraclavicular nerves so the patient with disease in the gall bladder inflammation in the gall bladder can have pain in the inferior angle of the scapula that means at the upper back you can say it is because of sympathetic innervation t7 to t9 thoracic segments then he may come with uh, pain on right shoulder so any anybody coming with pain in right shoulder you have to think of gall bladder also it is because of few twigs from the right phrenic nerve also and epigastrium epigastrium is Uh, easily you can make out because of the vagus nerve which supplies the stomach esophagus also and it is supplying uh, gall bladder also so epigastrium these are the three common sites for the biliary colic or you can say referred pain of uh, gall bladder okay so microanatomy of gall bladder or histology of gall bladder gi tract so like gi tract it should have four layers okay from this is lumen part this is luminal organ so this is the lumen part this is a wall as such where we have this epithelium lamina propria and muscularis mucosa as a third part so mucous membrane consists of epithelium lamina propria and muscularis mucosa which is absent here in gall bladder muscularis mucosa is absent so here the mucous membrane consists of epithelium which is lined by columnar epithelium and it has folds this mucous membrane with lamina propria is folded looks like appearance is similar to villi actually columnar epithelium but they have no corpulent cells in other parts of gi tract you may find corpulent cells in small intestine but not here okay so this is simple columnar epithelium you can make out with brush border will be there and this is lamina propria no muscularis mucosa sub mucosa is also very poorly developed after that you can see easily the muscles here so next will be muscle layer and outside this will be your serosa layer lined by mesothelium this is how your uh, 
the microanatomy of gallbladder is there and you can see this mucosal folds they are typical here okay anomalies of the gallbladder now they can be developmentally they can be a number of variations now sometimes in some individuals you may find double gallbladder with one common cystic duct or double gallbladder with separate cystic duct okay so it can be like sometimes you may find a diverticulum also a small diverticulum arising from this or you may find septate partial septa complete septa within the cavity of the gallbladder or you may find some uh, projection some projection a cap like structure near the fundus of the gallbladder this is called as phrygian cap because it appears like the cap here the female is wearing phrygian cap okay these are all congenital anomalies of gallbladder we have to uh, keep it in mind all these things when you are doing surgeries or when you are getting reports of uh, ultrasonography or uh, you are doing radiography of the gallbladder you may find two gallbladder cavities okay or some uh, extra uh, diverticulum or septate so these things are common as anomalies of gallbladder or sometimes uh, as i told you this is like uh, in the gallbladder fossa connected to the gallbladder fossa or uh, by some uh, fibrous tissue only or some smooth uh, fatty tissue will be there sometimes it is extra mobile or there can be presence of a mesentery also making the gallbladder very much mobile okay or sometimes gallbladder you may not see in the inferior surface of liver but major part of the gallbladder is present within the liver intrahepatic gallbladder so mobile or floating gallbladder intrahepatic gallbladder these are all anomalies of the gallbladder there can be stones in the gallbladder uh, approximately 10% of the people over age of 40 years more in females uh, the stones their the condition is called as cholelithiasis and the the stones are of different types okay so the most common is one the cholesterol stones and uh, later on they may undergo calcification also so gall stones can be uh, cholesterol stones pigment stones or mixed stone depending upon the constituents okay different types can be there so now biliary colic what is biliary colic actually uh, it is uh, the pain which is caused by spasm of the smooth muscles of the gall bladder in an attempt to expel the gall stones usually it is intermittent but it can be very intense also depending upon the if a stone or calculus gets impacted usually at the terminal end of cystic duct or at the lower end of the bile duct because in other parts if it is there the smooth muscles are very sparse not much so if it is in the ends in the ends of the cystic duct or gall or uh, common bile duct the muscles are more in number so the pain will be more severe and lumen is also narrow now what is the pathway actually if we say uh, this afferent fibers from the gall bladder actually they enters the thoracic segment because the sympathetic fibers they are coming from t7 to t9 so sensory fibers will go to t7 to t9 segments of the spinal cord and then uh, referred pain with this biliary colic is mostly in the right upper quadrant or you can say epigastrium of the abdomen because the same dermatomal supply is here t7 to t9 so gallstones or cholelithiasis as i mentioned uh, here if you have to visualize we can take radiograph but normally the gallbladder is not opaque to radiographs so we have to inject some dye intravenous dye or some uh, dyes can be given orally then they are excreted by the liver from the blood into the bile and then they reach the gallbladder in the gallbladder the dye is concentrated and the gallbladder becomes opaque to radiographs okay so in that way we the stones here you can see here clearly the location of gallbladder where you can see the radio opaque structures because of calcification the stones you are able to see clearly on the right side only not on the left side and most likely they are gall stones only because the location you can make out at the level of l1 cholecystectomy it is actually the surgical procedure of removal of gallbladder it can be done open Uh, through the open method open cystectomy if surgical method where incision is given in the anterior abdominal wall and gallbladder can be removed which was done earlier usually now it is uh, the laparoscopic method which is more commonly used for cholecystectomy okay
Now inflammation of the gallbladder called as cholecystitis. Most commonly it is called by the stones because it's cholelithiasis and which may lead to obstruction of the duct, cystic duct or bile duct. It can be acute or chronic. Okay. And uh, if you say symptoms, symptoms usually we have uh, biliary colic. The patient is coming with uh, pain in the epigastrium or it can be referred pain somewhere. You have to find clinically you have to see if jaundice is present or not because usually if inflammation is there because of the stones and obstruction somewhere, there will be jaundice. And third is you have to look for Murphy's sign whether it is positive or not. Usually Murphy's sign is positive in what is Murphy's sign? Here you have to give deep pressure in the right costal margin and patient is asked to take deep breath. And as the patient uh, leaves the breath, there will be such a sudden catch in the breath and patient will be having some stabbing type of pain. So here in the next slide, I am uh, going to show you a small video demonstration of this Murphy's sign. Ask the patient to exhale while palpating the gallbladder area medial to the midclavicular line. Now instruct the patient to take a deep breath so the gallbladder is pushed down and against the examiner's fingertips as the lungs expand. If cholecystitis is present, the patient will experience a sharp and sudden pain causing them to abruptly cease inhalation. This reaction is known as a positive Murphy's sign. I hope you understood the Murphy sign very well, very nicely explained in that video. Okay. Now, cholecystogram. As I told you earlier, we have to give uh, the dye intravenously or through mouth, and then radiograph is to be taken. This uh, the radiograph taken after giving the dye. Giving the dye. This is called as cholecystogram. Here you can see the gallbladder, cystic duct, common hepatic duct. Also, you can see and stones in another picture. Stones can be visualized. Another investigation which we use is like ultrasonography, very commonly a non-invasive method. You can see clearly in the gallbladder, this is a cavity of the gallbladder and you are able to see a stone over here. So this is very common investigation to be done. So coming to other parts of the biliary apparatus. First, uh, we have right and left hepatic ducts coming from right and left lobes of the liver. They unite near the puta hepatis and form common hepatic duct which is united by cystic duct at an acute angle called as cystohepatic angle and forming common bile duct CBD. Now the cystic duct. Cystic duct is a part of actually the gallbladder which starts from neck of the gallbladder approximately 3 to 5 centimeters long 2 millimeter in caliber. It is directed downwards and backwards joins CHT or common hepatic duct to form common bile duct. Now inside the mucous membrane, inside the wall you can see on the wall, towards the lumen we have this valvular structure. So actually the mucous membrane here is thrown into a number of folds, crescentric folds about 5 to 10 in number and they are spirally arranged, spiral in fashion and they are called as spiral valve of Hester. and their function is to make the lumen of the cystic duct patent. Now coming to another common bile duct or bile duct. As I mentioned earlier how it is formed. It is formed by union of the cystic duct at an acute angle with the common hepatic duct approximately 8 cm long and uh, 6 mm in diameter directed downwards, backwards and towards the right. It has to reach up to the second part of duodenum, posterior wall second part of the duodenum. It has four parts. So in relation to the duodenum, it can be supradural part, it can be retrodural part, it can be infradural part, and it is intradural part. So four parts are there. So coming to supradural part, the part of the duct, this common hepatic, common bile duct, sorry, uh, which is above the duodenum, it is actually the component of right free margin of lesser omentum approximately 2.5 centimeters in length and it runs in right free margin of lesser momentum along with a hepatic artery towards its left and behind there will be portal vein we can make out easily in this here we have hepatic artery towards its left and behind is a portal vein these are the contents of uh, lesser momentum and behind this there is epiploic foramina this area actually forms the anterior margin of epiploic foramina very important relations 
then coming to retrodural part the part which is going behind the duodenum okay and this uh, this part actually which is going here here it will be related to an artery very important uh, it uh, is related to gastroduodenal artery on its left and inferior vena cava will be there on the posterior aspects infraduodenal the part which will come below the duodenum and it grooves the posterior surface and uh, you can say upper and lateral parts of the posterior surface of pancreas it will be related to pancreas i'll show you in the next images intradural part or intramural part the part which which enters into the posteromedial surface of the second part of duodenum a little below its med middle part okay so this image is actually very beautiful image i can make out here easily what is this here common hepatic duct right and left joining common hepatic duct cystic duct this is common bile duct okay now see here this is a duodenum this is a uh, pyloric part of the stomach so you can make out here easily this is the pyloric part of the stomach this is first part of duodenum second part of duodenum third part of duodenum okay now the retroduodenal part this one this is coming here behind the first part of duodenum and here on its left it is related to this artery called as gastroduodenal artery which is coming from this artery here okay common hepatic artery so this gastroduodenal artery lies towards the left of the retroduodenal part of the common bile duct now this this part is called as infraduodenal part this is lodged actually in the pancreas on the posterior aspect and this part will be joined by the pancreatic duct to form the ampulla of waiter over here okay so uh, superior pancreatic duodenal artery you can see here one of the important relation from this gastroduodenal artery we have this artery superior pancreatic duodenal artery it crosses the bile duct anteriorly or sometimes posteriorly clinically it is a source of hemorrhage in exposure of infraduodenal part of the bile duct so in this diagram you have to see the relations of, of the retroduodenal part so retroduodenal part is related to first part of duodenum anteriorly and towards its left it is related to gastroduodenal artery okay for this you have to please read the celiac trunk what are the branches common three branches of the celiac trunk and uh, celiac trunk here it gives the hepatic artery this will be hepatic artery proper and the common hepatic artery actually it gives here this branch gastroduodenal artery which gives superior pancreatic duodenal and right gastroepiploic artery so this uh, pancreatic duodenal artery it has anterior branch and posterior branch so this is called as superior pancreatic duodenal artery so this is coming here on the groove towards the in between the second part of duodenum and pancreas here now what is hepato pancreatic ampulla actually you can make out here this is your common uh, bile duct coming in contact with the pancreatic duct both of their lumen are separate initially but later on as they come towards the second part of the duodenum posteromedial wall they join together to form one lumen okay so it bulges they form a opening again which is bulging into the mucous membrane of duodenum forming a papilla called as major duodenal papilla and the opening of this the opening of this common uh, opening of the duct and both the ducts actually the distal constricted end of this ampulla opens into this on the summit of major duodenal papilla approximately 8 to 10 cm distal to pylorus this is important here because if you have to reach up to this end you should know what is the distance from pylorus because when you are doing specially the some procedures you are uh, inserting an endoscope or you are inserting the doing the procedure of uh, ERCP you have to take care of how much you have to go to reach the ampulla of waiter the ampulla of waiter is actually named after uh, abraham waiter which is a german anatomist who has uh, published his work on this okay so this is called as hepato pancreatic ampulla of waiter okay now sphincters around the terminal parts of bile duct and pancreatic duct so here we have separate sphincter sphincter cholidocus cholidocus is a word actually used for the bile ducts and call it this is sphincter of pancreas sphincter pancreaticus together the common opening is again a separate sphincter is there for this called as sphincter of ampullae or sphincter of od okay 
and this will be opening into the major dude this actually the projection is leading to formation of a bulge into the lumen called as papilla or you can say ampulla on which we have this opening that is papilla arterial supply of the ducts common bile duct or bile duct uh, the the artery ducts actually and they are derived from nearby arteries for the upper part we can say it is mostly derived from cystic artery for the middle part it is right hepatic artery and for lower part it will be from posterior superior pancreatico duodenal artery which is a branch from gastro duodenal artery it is important to understand actually uh, the blood supply over here for the four cut you get a celiac trunk this is abdominal aorta here we have celiac trunk from which we have left gastric we have splenic and common hepatic common hepatic gives gastro duodenal artery and then it is called as hepatic artery proper gastro duodenal artery divides into or it forms superior pancreatic duodenal artery which has anterior and posterior branches now the superior pancreatic duodenal anterior posterior branches they anastomose with the inferior pancreatic duodenal artery which is a branch from superior mesenteric artery artery of midcut now this anastomosis is important to understand because if there is uh, if the anastomosis between the two is poor and ligation of superior pancreatic duodenal artery is done to in the surgeries of the biliary tract it may lead to avascular necrosis of common bile duct some variations are there in the duct cystic duct also or in the bile duct also but commonly here we can see this cystic duct may have a low attachment to the common hepatic duct or it can be adhered to the common hepatic duct they may not be joining at an angle or it can be very high junction or it may join right hepatic duct instead of common hepatic duct or it may go behind the duodenum and then it is opening in the lower part or it can be absent or it can be forming loop behind or in front of the common hepatic duct okay these are the common variations of cystic duct which we have to keep in mind while doing surgeries related to gall bladder now what is jaundice i won't go into that much detail but actually you can see in the eyes of this patient here the sclera this white part is called as sclera so they are appearing yellowish so uh, the jaundice is a clinical condition actually which is um, leading to yellowish discoloration of the skin mucous membranes and sclera of the eyes due to increase in level of bilirubin normally it is less than 1 mg per deciliter but it uh, goes up to 2 or 3 more than 2 is always called as Uh, leading to the appearance of symptoms and the clinically the which you see is called as icterus okay now it can be of obstructive and non obstructive but in biliary tract if we say we are mostly concerned with the obstructive cause of the jaundice actually now the, the obstruction of the biliary tract can be within the duct in the form of gall stones it can be in the wall in the form of the cholangiocarcinoma cholangiocarcinoma is a carcinoma of the biliary tract biliary ducts and outside the wall where there is pancreatic cancer compressing these ducts ultimately anything leading to obstruction of the common bile duct okay so bile cannot go into the second part of duodenum so uh, the outside the wall it, as i told it can be lymph, no lymph nodes also and large neoplastic hepatic lymph nodes also can compress the common bile duct leads to obstruction and ultimately jaundice obstructive kind of jaundice one law is there coercious law they say jaundice a patient is coming with jaundice with distended and palpable gall bladder if it is like this it's most commonly due to some extrinsic obstruction of the common bile duct that means it can be because of some extrinsic cause which can be head of uh, carcinoma of the head of the pancreas or it can be the lymph node enlargement leading to compression and when patient comes with jaundice with non distended non palpable gall bladder then it is mostly due to some intrinsic obstruction mostly the impaction of gall stones leading to fibrosis inflammatory previous inflammatory fibrosis and that's why you are not able to make out the gall bladder so gall bladder here is small okay so if the patient is coming with palpable gall bladder and jaundice most likely the cause is extrinsic outside the wall of the duct or lumen of the duct if it is very small you are not able to palpate the gall bladder but jaundice is present now mostly it is because of something inside 
the lumen of the gallbladder this is stones this is called as cobbler's law very important clinically in another way you can make out if the cbd is up Uh, is obstructed due to calculus. The gallbladder is usually not distended owing to previous inflammatory fibrosis. If obstruction of the gallbladder is due to growth, and gallbladder becomes distended in order to reduce uh, pressure in the biliary system, then this uh, vice versa actually we can make out. This is your Cobbler's law. Common and very important method of is endoscopic retrograde cholangiopancreatography (ERCP). Here you can see in this, an endoscope is inserted through the mouth into the duodenum. So it is going through the esophagus, esophagus and stomach, and then second part of duodenum. Once you reach the second part of duodenum, here through this endoscope, a catheter is injected or inserted into the biliary uh, or pan pancreatic ducts, and through that catheter, dye is injected, and so that you can visualize a pathway to know if there is any obstruction or if there is any growth like that. So this is all done about the gallbladder and the related parts of extrahepatic biliary apparatus with their associated applied aspects. I hope you all are able to make out. Kindly uh, read it from your books also. Thank you.